Hello everyone. Today's topic is ellipsis, which is related to substitution uh, in many ways, uh, but the big difference is that instead of putting a word in, as you do with substitution, uh, one, same, do, so, not, the substitutes, you take words out, but people still understand what you mean. How does this work? How can we leave something out and yet still be understood? That's what we're going to talk about now. The, there are many gaps in language, right? Especially spoken when we are often focused on efficiency and we rely on the fact that other people are with us when we talk for the most part. Of course, we can talk at a distance on the phone and so on, but often people are with us and we're focused on efficiency and we rely on the context and the other words, the co-text, to uh, save time by not saying things but expecting to be understood. How does this work? Think of this simple little example, right? I say, where's my book? And my wife says, on the sofa. Now, a good way to think of this for uh, ellipsis is to imagine, that, what's the difference between someone who hears both lines, someone who hears what's my book and someone who hears on the sofa, will understand what's meant. They will understand that Gwen is saying, uh, your book is on the sofa. She has to mean that. Think of how that's different from someone who, say, someone steps into the room just as Gwen says, on the sofa. So they enter the room and they hear Gwen say, on the sofa. Now they understand each of those words individually on the sofa. They know what each of those mean on its own and they understand that it's a prepositional phrase, but they don't, they can't interpret anything other than that, right? They'd have a way of knowing your book is on the sofa, or uh, the dog is on the sofa, or uh, on the sofa is my favorite place to take a nap or whatever, right? They wouldn't know. So that's why, that's how that's often useful, right? To think about what you would know if you heard the whole thing versus what you would know if you only heard the latter part. And that shows you that when you hear the whole thing, you're able to make a, a bigger interpretation of that gap. The ellipsis is the words, your book is. That's the ellipsis. The fact that Gwen says on the sofa, she leaves out your book is, that is omitted, right? That's what ellipsis is. Leaving something out, but knowing that the reader or listener will be able to interpret exactly what it is, exactly what's missing. Uh, it's missing information that is grammatically necessary, right? On the sofa is a prepositional phrase. For language to make sense, you need a clause, you need a, a verb, and usually a subject, right? You definitely need a verb, though. If you say on the sofa, there is no verb and there's no subject there, so we can't make sense of it. Like I said, on the sofa, does it mean your dog is on the sofa? Does it mean uh, any of the other examples I just gave? So, it's grammatically necessary information necessary in the sense that we need it to make sense. It's not other stuff, right? It, which book is it? What color is the sofa? Whose sofa is it? All that kind of stuff. That's missing information, right? We don't know what book you're talking about. We don't know if it's an old sofa or a new sofa or whatever, but we don't need that for it to be a grammatically complete clause, right? Your book is on the sofa is grammatically complete, right? Uh, yes, you could add more. Your old book is on the green sofa. You could add more but you don't need words like old and green. It, ellipsis is about, the study of ellipsis is about figuring out which grammatical elements are missing and how do we find them from the context or the co-text. Uh, in written language, again, uh, another example, he walked past the station and to the shop. Think about what the full, it, What's the full thing that's being said here? If, if you wanted to say every word that is meant here, right? We read this and we understand it, but the writer means some, there's some words that the writer means that aren't said here, right? He walked past the station and he walked to the shop, right? Past the station uh, is, a, a, again, like in a previous example, it's not always this case, but it's a prepositional phrase, right? You need more information. You, I can't just say to you, pass the station. You'll be like, what? Pass the station is where you'll see the barber shop. It's not enough. He walked, a uh, subject verb, he walked where, past the station. Then you have and, which is a conjunction, right? A coordinating conjunction. It joins two equal things. 
Well, before the end, you have you walk past the station. There's a clause. Because you have an and, you need a clause on the other side of and as well. If you just have to the shop, that's not a clause. That's a prepositional phrase, right? So our brain, your brain is doing this for you, right? I mean, because you speak English, it doesn't matter if you remember words like coordinating conjunction and prepositional phrase. None of that matters, right? I mean, those are the words that I'm using now to describe what's happening. But of course, anyone who speaks English can make this interpretation. Their brain says, hey, to the shop's not enough. Uh, does that mean, you know, run to the shop? It's not enough. Where can I find the subject and verb for this to the shop phrase in order to turn it into a clause? And so anaphorically, right, pointing back from that ellipsis, the, the ellipsis is the gap between and and to, right? To describe ellipsis, you can only say where the gap is, right? There's a gap between and and to. There's an elliptical gap between and and to that anaphorically presupposes he walked. That's how you'd write this, right? That, uh, or, or say it, as I just did. So ellipsis fits in down at the level here, right? That we've got language, and language is composed of what linguists call texts, right? Certain amounts of language, either spoken or written, that belong together. Uh, how do we know what makes up one text? How do we know what separates this bit of language from that bit of language because there are cohesive properties here and there are cohesive properties here and so you don't get mixed up right someone's talking to you and a song is playing and you don't see that as one big jumble of words you recognize that those are two separate texts because of the cohesive properties and from your studies and reading you will be familiar with reference and substitution as two types of cohesion and today we're talking about ellipsis, which exists then down at that same level as reference and substitution. Uh, more examples. Here's the kind of place where you might want to pause this and think about it yourself. Would you like to hear another verse? I know 12 more. Can you figure out where the ellipsis is here? That, uh, this is a good place to perhaps think about what if you only heard the second sentence? What if you only heard I know 12 more? What would you be able to understand of that? And what could someone who heard both sentences interpret more fully than you? I'm using this uh, symbol as to, to indicate where the ellipsis is, right? If you're writing this, you could say there is an there is ellipsis after the word more in the second sentence. You realize that this means, would you like to hear another verse? I know 12 more verses, right? To just say, I know 12 more more what, right? More is a modifier. It has to modify something. More people, more bananas, whatever. More verses. We need something there. Uh, and you interpret this by saying, okay, we need something. 12 more what? We need something there, which would be a noun, because more is a modifier, and it modifies a noun. Modifies a noun. What nouns in this little text could fill that spot? A uh, verse would work there. So you could say it like this, right? Uh, the ellipsis after 12 more presupposes, you know that term, right? It presupposes. What, what does it mean at this time? What does the space after more mean in this particular test? Uh, in this particular text, sorry. Presupposes that the information can be found elsewhere in the text where earlier, anaphorically, I know 12 more verses possible for ellipsis to be exophoric outside of the text too. Uh, harder, I think, without some pretty clear context, right? You see a sign like this on a door, push, that's a glass door, it says push, it also says it in uh, Chinese. Uh, push what, right? You're not going to, because of the placement of the sign, you will realize that it's saying push this door. Uh, so there is, it, you can understand it from the context in this case, right? You're you're unlikely to see a sign push and then push something other than the thing that the sign is on because of your understanding of how signs work as a genre, right? They're placed on or close to the thing that they are talking about, giving information about. So ellipsis is possible exophorically as well. But for the most part, in the text. Uh, here we see 
Yet another example, anaphoric, right? He won't do the washing up, so I'll have to. I'll have to, right? Imagine just hearing that. I won't say this anymore, I think. But imagine someone coming in just to hear, so I'll have to. They'd recognize that there's a subject there, I, and there's the will have to. Some uh, uh, will is a modal verb, have to is a, a, another kind of modal verb, right? Like Like must, right? So I will have to, but there's no main verb. I'll have to what, right? We need the main verb there. I'll have to talk to you later. I'll have to study harder, whatever. You don't know. Ah, you won't know if you only came in for the second part, so I'll have to. But of course, anyone who heard the whole thing would know that it means he won't do the washing up, so I'll have to do the washing up. So that, uh, that ellipsis after two is interpreted by looking back anaphorically at the preceding cotext. It can be cataphoric, uh, like with all, like in all cases, cataphoric uh, is cataphora, cataphora, cataphora is the noun form, cataphoric is the adjective, right? Uh, it's less common and it's often used for some sort of effect, right? To catch someone's attention, you use a bit of cataphora and they, they mm, what's going on here? They, I have to listen to see what's going on here, right? Since he won't, won't what, right? We know that won't is not enough. Again, that's a, a he, since he will not, will is a modal verb, but modal verbs need main lexical verbs, right? Since he will not, negative, not, still need the main verb. Since he will not, reduced to won't. Since he won't, won't what? I'll have to do the washing up. Ah, the washing, do the washing up appears later in the sentence. Only at that point is the presupposition satisfied, right? And then you can interpret this as since he won't do the washing up, I'll have to do the washing up. Very, very common. Not a complex, I, the reason I use this example, this next example, is to show you that sometimes people seem to think that ellipsis is some sort of advanced technique in writing or speaking. Uh, it's not, right? Here is uh, a little bit from Alice in Wonderland, a story for children, right? And yet, uh, and there's four examples of ellipsis here in the next slide, and yet children understand it, right? So this is something that is fundamental to the way we use and understand language, is both producing and receiving language, right? Producing, uh, saying or writing, and receiving, listening or hearing. Uh, fundamental to that is the fact that there are these gaps, we use them and we expect them to be used, and we expect to have to interpret them as we listen or read. So. Uh, here is again a place where I recommend that you pause this and look for, as I said, four places where something has been uh, left out, but the two participants would understand what is meant in those spots, right? You can use the symbol that I suggested earlier, the circle with the line through it, write it right on the text if you've got a copy of this, and write in which words are missing. And now that you've had time to pause and do that, let's look at what's going on here, right? So perhaps you've spotted that uh, if the, in the second sentence, that, or sorry, the, the, not the second sentence, in the turtle's turn, the turtle says, 10 hours of verse day, said the mock turtle, nine the next and so on. Nine what, right? We can't just have nine, you need nine something, right? If I just say you give me two, give me five, uh, five watts, two watts, right? Nine, and then so you'll realize that, aha, the turtle means 10 hours the first day, nine hours the next, and so on. And there's another one here, right? I'm, I'm rewriting the, the second line, or the turtle's turn over and over and adding more and more ellipsis. Nine, the next what? The next day, it has to be the next day. 10 hours the first day, said the mock turtle, nine hours the next day, and so on. And you may have realized that, in fact, at both of these points, the green uh, ellipsis, the same thing is missing in both of these cases, right? If the turtle just says 10 hours the first day, uh, that doesn't make sense to anyone who just arrived at that point. 10 hours the first day, what? You need, in fact, a subject and verb here, right? The turtle is really saying we did lessons 10 hours the first day, said the mock turtle, we did lessons nine the next, and so on. And if you put it all together, you get this, right? So in, in 
uh, four places in this simple story for children, uh, the ellipsis has been used, and yet children would have no problem understanding this, right, in filling in those elliptical gaps themselves as they listen. So this is, as I said, the, the point here is that ellipsis is something very common to language right from when we begin speaking and writing and reading, right? This idea that we leave things out and expect them to be understood. Uh, a brief comparison, reference, substitution, and ellipsis, in case you're forgetting what we've looked at earlier, right? I like your car, I'd love to drive it. So here, it is a reference, it means your car. I like your car, I've never been in a nicer one. Here, one means car. So notice with reference, it means your car. It means the same thing we talked about, right? I like your car. It means your car. Substitution, we're always doing something a little different, talking about that type of thing, cars, but not talking about the same car, right? I like your car. We're talking about your car. I've never been in a nicer one. Now we're talking about cars that I've been in. Uh, and I like your car. I've never seen a nicer car, right? You're doing the same thing as substitution, except you're leaving, instead of using the word one, you're leaving the word one out. You're leaving the word car out, but expecting it to be understood. So sub that's why the very first slide said substitution and ellipsis. They're the same uh, in, in that they both have that property of repudiation that we talked about when we looked at substitution. Uh, notice with the ellipsis, you're not talking about the same car again, right? I'm not talking about your car. I'm talking about I've never seen a nicer. I'm now talking about cars that I've seen and comparing them to your car, saying that, that I've never seen a nicer. But we're not talking about your car again. So substitution and ellipsis are the same in that sense that you're not talking about the, the identical item uh, as in reference where it means your car. We're talking about the same physical thing. Substitution and ellipsis are the same in that they both have repudiation. We're talking about the same general class of things, cars, but not the same specific one. Substitution and ellipsis uh, can thus be described like this. Substitution is the replacement of one item by another. The other here, the another here, you know the words, one, same, do, so, not. Ellipsis, you just leave things, you leave it out, and yet in both cases, the reader or listener will understand. Now, you remember that the types of substitution were nominal, verbal, clausal, as seen in these examples. You can pause if you want to look at them more carefully. But the important point is nominal, verbal, clausal. You can thus guess if reference, uh, sorry, if substitution and ellipsis are the same, what are the types going to be? Nominal, verbal, clausal, right? Same three types. Two boys passed and then another two passed. Uh, in a minute, I'll have slides that show these in detail. But for now, you can see that the verb uh, down at the end of the sentence, to pass, to what passed, right? Two boys passed. Boys is a noun. It's been omitted there. That means that's nominal ellipsis. What the person is saying is two boys passed and then another two boys passed. Verbal means a verb has been left out or part of a verb, right? Have you been swimming? Yes, I have. Yes, I have what? Yes, I have been to Brazil. Yes, I have eaten pizza for lunch, whatever. No, in this case, it only means, yes, I have been swimming. That's verbal ellipsis because the verb or part of the verb has been left out. And here, clausal, what was he going to do? Plant a row of trees. You realize that the second sentence, plant a row of trees, is interpreted as he was going to plant a row of trees. That's clausal ellipsis because both the subject, he, and the verb was going to have been omitted, right? Verbal ellipsis, just the verb or part of the verb is left out. Clausal ellipsis means the subject and the verb or part of the verb have been left out. So like with substitution, three types, nominal, verbal, clausal, same for ellipsis. Here, you can look at these, uh, you can pause and look at these if you want to see the transformation more carefully, but I just talked through them. Nominal ellipsis, verbal ellipsis, clausal ellipsis. What's happening is that 
in a little more detail is that if you look at the first part, two boys, two is a modifier, right? It tells us something about two big boys, two small boys, right? It tells us about the boys. What kind of boys? Well, in this case, two. A modifier on its own doesn't work, right? You can't say two past. You can't say big past. You need big boys, two boys. Then you get down to the green two at the end. Well, the same thing, right? You've got that modifier two. It needs to modify something two what's, right? Uh, two is the modifier, boys is a head, right? I've used the term head before the main word of the phrase in this case, the noun phrase two boys. Two is the modifier, boys is the head. It's the same down at the end of the sentence. You've got two and you look at it and it looks like a modifier two, but you realize that ah, because of ellipsis, you'll, you'll accept two as the head here. You'll accept two past at the end of the sentence because you know that that boys is been cut out. Uh, so, it, but it's now acceptable, right? To see two as the head uh, upgraded as it's explained on the slide. It wouldn't work on its own, right? If I just said, uh, you know, three entered and you'd say, what? Three entered, three's not enough because it seems there, well, it is there, a modifier, three entered, but you say three students entered the room and then another three entered, the second three, another three entered, you say, ah, three, that works, that's enough as a head of entered, three entered is now a subject verb because you have students earlier on in the sentence. You can practice that a bit here by looking and pausing as appropriate, right? Look at how which lasts longer, the curved rods or the straight rods, you've got, we're talking about rods, but they're modified, what kind of rods, curved or straight? You get to the second sentence, the straight are less likely to break, and again, if you only had be speaking here, the straight are less likely to break, you'd say straight's a modifier, right? The, the straight line, the curved line, like that, right? But here you realize straight can work as a head, it can work as the subject of R because you know that straight here really is interpreted as straight rods. And so you can see that as it says here that there's, there's the two sentences, which last longer the curved rods or the straight rods, and the second sentence, the straight are less likely to break. The sentence boundary, I mean the, the end of the sentence, the full stop, the exclamation mark, the question mark, right? Terminal punctuation as it's called. That's the sentence boundary. There's a, there's, a, there's a split between the two sentences which grammar does not carry across, right? Grammar exists within one sentence. You have a subject and then a verb and so on within one sentence. But when you get to the second sentence, the straight are less likely to break. For that sentence to make sense, you need to stick cohesion. You need to stick it to the first sentence and see that the straight is only interpretable by seeing that it means the straight rods. So you look across to the other sentence, you see that they stick together. It's cohesive, right? This is why ellipsis is a form of cohesion. This is why ellipsis helps us see that different sentences, different parts of the text belong together and that they do in fact form a text. How do you figure out what words are missing? Well, sometimes it's really, it's pretty simple, right? In the, in the sense here that we just saw two boys passed and then another two passed, you realize that boys is the part that was cut. Usually that's all you need to do, right? It's, it's I think, reasonably simple to see what's missing. Sometimes, as you'll see here, you need to do a little bit of manipulation. It's with these expressions like a little, a lot, most, some, where in the first, look at this example, how did you, one person says, how did you enjoy the film? The other says a lot was very good, though not all. What's happened here? The first person has said, how did you enjoy the film? The first person has asked about the entire film. The second person has chosen to not talk about the entire film, but to talk about some part of the film, a lot, right? These kind of expressions, and notice other things that would fit there. How did you enjoy the film? Most was very good. How did you enjoy the film? Some was very good. How did you enjoy the film? A bit was very good. These expressions where we choose to talk about part, a lot, some, most, a little, 
are in fact called partitive expressions. That's one name for them, partitive. The first person says, how did you enjoy the film? The first person asks about the whole thing. You don't have to answer talking about the whole thing. You can choose to talk about part. When you use a partitive expression, a lot, a little, some, we often find ellipsis in places like this. Uh, and you can see that in order for it to make sense to be interpreted, it's not like with where with the previous example with boys, where it was just the word boys that you would put in to understand of it, to understand it. You can see here that really what's happening is if we want to interpret it, we need that of the for it to make sense, right? Remember the asterisk is showing you that this is not, I'm showing you a sentence, a lot film was very good though not all, and the asterisk, asterisk is to remind you this is not possible or at least highly unusual. Really your interpretation, you have to insert in the of the for this to make sense in its full form. A lot of the film was very good, though not all. But when I say it, I don't need to say a lot of the was very good, though not all. I can just say a lot was very good, though not all. And you understand that I'm saying a lot of the film was very good, though not all. Uh, and notice there's some ellipsis tacked on at the end too, right? Though not all. Ah, all of the film was very good. Really, the whole answer here, look how short it was in words. A lot was very good, though not all. But in meaning, you're saying a lot of the film was very good, though not all of the film was very good. You could say all that, perhaps if you wanted to be emphatic, right? To, to use your the way you say the words and you wanted to be emphatic. A lot of the film was very good, though not all of the film was very good. For some reason, you, you, but that's how it works with ellipsis. You can always choose to say the whole thing if you want. Uh, and sometimes in written form, as I said right back at the start, we're, we're maybe less likely to use, no, I shouldn't say maybe, we're less likely to use ellipsis in written form because often we want to be more precise, make sure that everything's understood because your reader can't ask you, sorry, what did you mean? Because they're reading it, you know, on the bus, in their bedroom, whatever. Uh, whereas with spoken language, sometimes we are more apt, more likely to use ellipsis because the person can always, well, and many other things that we do in spoken language, because the person can ask, sorry, what did you mean? Uh, so we're often more implicit when we speak, right? We leave things out, we assume the person will understand. Ah, there I had the word, partitive expression, right? That I said earlier. Uh, so that's, these are all examples of nominal, nominal ellipsis, verbal ellipsis, uh, here's a few examples, a few points about verbal ellipsis. I'm at the park with my daughter when she's young, some years ago, not now. She doesn't talk like this now. She says, Daddy slide, Mama too, right? So she's sort of commanding us, Daddy slide, Mama too. She wants us to go down the slide. Uh, look at the first one, Daddy slide. She's used uh, an imperative, slide. Uh, and she's named me as the one who should slide, right? So she's directed at me, Daddy slide. Then she says, Mama too. What she means, of course, you realize now, is that the, the verb slide is left out of her second sentence. She means daddy slide, mama slide to. Verbal ellipsis. She's left the verb slide out, but expects to be understood. This is the reason I show you this one. Uh, it caught my attention years ago when she was four or five or something, is to say that uh, kids do this right from when they're very young, right? They use ellipsis right from when they're very young, they understand that it's a, a normal property of language. It's not something that you have to be particularly old, particularly clever, particularly good at language to do. Kids do it right from when they're young, right? So daddy slide, mama slide too. She expects to be understood. Uh, she expects mama to interpret this as a command for mama to go down the slide. It can be the whole verb, as in that previous example, slide was gone. It's also possible for just part of the verb to be the verb group. I'm using verb group to mean the whole verb, all the words that make up the verb, right? Have you been swimming? Yes, I have. We still have, we have the ellipsis after have. We have been swimming have been, the two words been swimming have been cut, have been omitted. Uh, have you been swimming? Yes, I have. Verbal ellipsis of been swimming. That's the way you could write it, right? If, if I asked you to explain the ellipsis in R's turn, yes, I have, you, would, you could write, there is verbal ellipsis of 
been swimming after the word have. Clausal ellipsis, more than the verb, but the subject and the verb are omitted, right? He was going to plant a row of trees. He, in the second sentence, obviously, he, subject, verb, was going to. All that the person said was plant a row of trees, but they expect the listener to anaphorically presuppose he was going to from the first sentence. So keep that in mind, right? Verbal ellipsis, it's just the verb or part of the verb. Clausal ellipsis, a clause is made up a subject, made up of a subject and a verb and maybe some more. With clausal ellipsis, you have to see that the clause and the verb, or at least part of the verb, are missing. Some comparisons. Has the plane landed? Yes, it has. Has the plane landed? Yes, it has done which sounds a little bit awkward to me, but I might, I guess I might say that, yes, it has done, uh, if you wanted to be emphatic, right? Yes it, yes, it has done, done, in order to stress that word and emphasize. But you know that in both of these cases, it means, yes, it has landed. Uh, who was playing the piano? Peter was, Peter was. Who was playing the piano? Peter was playing the piano. With substitution, who was playing the piano? Peter was doing it, right? Peter was playing it. It is the piano, of course, so there you have doing is substitution, verbal substitution, and it is the piano, personal reference. Uh, the only point I'm making here is that because way back at the start I said that ellipsis and substitution are the same, whoop, because ellipsis and substitution are the same uh, in many ways, uh, you, you can always do one or the other. You can always, both are always possible, right? You could use a substitute or you could use ellipsis. What we have here is another place where I think you should pause and think about uh, where the ellipsis exists here before moving on pr to practice it. Up till now I've been giving reasonably short, simple sentences uh, to show how this works. Here is a, a, the first paragraph of a newspaper story and, and of course you'll read it and you'll understand everything. But what I'm asking you to do is to read it and then slow down the process and think, okay, you've read this and understood it, but what, is, what have you done to understand it? What missing information, in other words, what ellipsis, nominal, verbal, causal, have you inserted into this to make sense of it? And you may be surprised at how many things you put into this that were grammatically necessary in order for you to understand it. Uh, find at least one, push for two, you'll see that there are more, but find at least one, try to find two places where there's some ellipsis in here. Pause now and try that. Okay, and now that you've tried it, you may have noticed that here we have and chatted, right? and chatted. Chatted is a verb, needs a subject. What's the subject of chatted? Two teenage girls, right? Those are the only... Chatted means that we need some people to do the chatting. The only people that exist in the text so far are two teenage girls, so it's two teenage girls chatted. Uh, look down here, you have a comma and then clothes, right? I can show you what it looked like before, right? Just the comma and clothes. Now, if you think of that word clothes on its own, it doesn't, if you just say clothes to someone, clothes, what? It could be the subject, clothes are getting more expensive, or uh, it could be the, 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 the object, I need to buy some new clothes, right? We don't really know what to do with a word on its own, clothes. Of course, you know what to do with it here because you can see what information is presupposed from elsewhere in the text, in this case earlier. So, in fact, you have the first ellipsis, two teenage girls chatted, that's nominal ellipsis because a noun has been omitted, or rather a noun phrase, right? Girls, what kind of girls? Two teenage girls. Then you have clausal ellipsis before clothes, two teenage girls chatted about clothes. Uh, or, you, you, of course, you're interpreting that as the same two teenage girls, right? And now you can see that Probably if you pause now and think about how that works for the rest of the sentence, you'll see that that same clausal ellipsis, two teenage girls chatted about, appears again, right? Here and, whoop, 
here, sorry, it was all on the same slide, right? Really what you're saying is this, right? The two teenage girls chatted about boys, the, those same two teenage girls chatted about clothes, those same two teenage girls chatted about their weekend plans, and those same two teenage girls chatted about whatever seemed to pop into their heads. When you were in school, you probably used that you use a comma to separate items in a list, right? Which you've done here. What did the two teenage girls chat about? Boys, clothes, their weekend plans, and whatever seemed to pop in their heads. Use commas to separate a list, yes. But that's talking about the orthography, how to write it. What I'm talking about now is how does the listener interpret this? They see a bunch of words, uh, clothes, weekend plans, whatever seem to pop, and they have to interpret those by finding grammar to make those words or phrases work to make sense of them. And so they look back and see that, oh yeah, we do have a subject and a subject to teenage girls and we do have a verb chatted. Of course, you would never really think about this as you're reading. You just do it because you know how language works. But what I'm asking you to do is to, as I said, slow things down and try to explain how your brain made the language work for you. They were clearly friends, but one repeat, this is the next sentence uh, from the newspaper article. It was, it was a newspaper, it may seem weird here, but it was a newspaper article about uh, uh, swearing in, in, in Mexico and how people use it as a form of bonding, right? They were clearly friends, but one repeatedly referred to the other with a Spanish word meaning ox or steer or stupid. Again, you might want to pause here and think about where the elliptical gaps are. What have you put into this uh, single sentence in order to make sense of it? Now, you know that there's the reference here. They refers back to the previous paragraph. I didn't ask you about that, but I'm just reminding you that all of these exist in, in combination, right? They are clearly friends. They is the two teenage girls who chatted away about clothes and boys and whatever popped into their heads that were just mentioned were clearly friends, but one, one what? But one girl, right? There's ellipsis there, one, one repeatedly, one can't repeatedly do anything, you need one something. One girl, uh, nominal ellipsis, repeatedly referred to the other who, the other what, the other girl, nominal ellipsis with a Spanish word meaning, whoop, meaning ox or steer or stupid. So ellipsis uh, is very common, it exists in common with all of the other cohesive forms that you've seen and that you will see, reference, substitution, ellipsis, and, and more to come. It fits in here in terms of uh, its, its level with reference and substitution, and the types are this, right? Nominal, verbal, clausal. And I think if you can remember that, right, that there is nominal ellipsis, verbal ellipsis, clausal ellipsis, and that it's Refer, ellipsis refers to, ellipsis means gaps in the language that can be understood from the co-text or the context. If you can remember that, the three types and the fact that it means gaps that can be interpreted by looking at the other words or at the context, the situation, that means you've got a, a firm grasp of what's going on so far and we'll talk about it more uh, as time goes on. So good, thank you very much. Take care, bye.